Let's uh, have a word of prayer as we get going. Heavenly Father, we praise you for Sabbath. We praise you for the gospel message, Father. It is a full, complete Alpha and Omega message for us, Father. And help us, Lord, to understand and present it. As we see this world's coming apart at the seams, Lord, we have the answer. You've given it to your people. May we use it, Father, to our and to everyone's benefit. May your spirit be here with us as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude at least what I'm doing on Philadelphia this week. And I want to expound upon, I'm not going to go any more further in John 3. Uh, however, the statement that Jesus made to Nicodemus uh, is a very serious, perplexing statement to his people today. Which one was that? Well, I think out of everything that Jesus said and back and forth, this is the most powerful and damning statement that he makes to his church. And he says, and, and the thing is, he's addressing it to one of the leaders, one of the high-ranking leaders. And he would emerge, this individual, as one of the only leaders near the end of uh, the Jewish history, as if you will, as, as a nation, as, as you know, uh, Jerusalem fell. And he says, Jesus answered and said to him in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, not Jesus, Nicodemus, how can these things be? And this is Jesus simply talking about the gospel message. It's all he's talking about here. Simple, easy, you must be born again, gospel message. Simple. Then he goes on to say, Jesus answered in verse 10 to him, being Nicodemus, are you a master of Israel? And you notice he didn't say in Israel. What did he say? You're one of the major leaders of this nation, which is actually my nation, which is my church, and you don't know this. Folks, <laughs> that is the most profound statement, I think, in the Bible toward God's church. How is it that we have leaders that do not know what it means to be? How think about that. Not leaders, but he said a master of Israel. Not in Israel. You're not just one of the low-ranking teachers. You are one of the leaders. Now, I want to say, this doesn't only pertain to conference people. The independents are way off the map, too, especially with the health message. They have that so twisted, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, Rodney? There's not a whole lot of difference today. Uh, Babylon uh, only goes to justification. They don't teach sanctification. And, of course, the conference is, uh, has stopped it as well. But, you know, there's three phases to, to being born again. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. And the Adventist church is the only one that, that has taught uh, sanctification. And uh, so there's no difference today than there was then. No, actually, I disagree totally and completely with you. There's a big difference, Rodney. We're far more guilty. We are far more guilty than Nicodemus was. Have, I'm not, I'm just saying. However, nobody knows what justification means or sanctification anymore. Nobody knows that. See, exactly. To them, uh, and I told Ro uh, 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 Rodney, I'm not arguing, I'm saying we're far worse than Nicodemus was. At least this man had the chutzpah to go and spend time with Jesus. Are our leaders doing that? No. Notice he didn't say a master in, he said of. 
That's a diff big difference. You are one of the rules and what you make laws for this nation. You're not just a teacher. You set down theology, laws, principle. You write rules. And how come you don't know We are worse than they were. Because we don't want it. He wanted it. Nicodemus wanted it. He knew something was wrong. But you ask... See, in my opinion, it's mind works. There's really only one thing. It's sanctification. Righteousness by faith. That is the baby food of the process. Why are we still... How many churches can you go to today... Seventh-day Adventist, independent of conference, and hear sermons on righteousness by faith. Dozens, thousands. We've heard them here. Oh, you're saved by grace, not by your works. We don't understand righteousness, grace. Really? That's the baby step. I want to go to Peter and look at what Peter has to say. Right, Rodney, we're arguing over the Holy Spirit. But watch this. Watch this, what Peter says about the Holy Spirit. Watch this. In 1 Peter 1, Peter says, 1 Peter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethany, elect, now, now listen, elect, listen to what he says, according to, to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of what? Where does sanctification come from according to Peter? First you have to, what that word elect, what does it mean? We see that word elect a lot in the apostles' writings and people use that to say predestined. No, elect in a theological, well let me read you the definition of that word. Election. Uh, elect, well, I'm going to use the word, the definition of election. Elect is, is, is the same, but election is the process. It is a choice. Okay, listen to what the Webster 1928 Webster says about this word. In theology, divine choice, predetermination of God, by which persons are distinguished as objects of mercy, become subjects of grace, are sanctified and prepared for heaven. It's a choice. To be sanctified and prepared for heaven. The elect is basically the same. So there is a choice on both sides. Is there not? But for us to come to the choice, we have to have the Holy Spirit. Why are we arguing about the Holy Spirit? Nicodemus didn't understand the Holy Spirit either, did he? What do you mean? What is the Holy Spirit? Remember the conversation? Jesus said, people who are born of the Spirit know the Spirit. If you're not, you don't. And then he asks him that question. And I think it's the most profound question in the Bible when it comes to the church, my opinion. How is it then the leadership should read this every day when they get up. How is it that you are a master of Israel, not in Israel? This is high-level government, okay, if you will, and you don't know about two things. What two things did Jesus say Nicodemus had not a clue about? And they go hand in hand. Holy Spirit. today. I said, I think there's a big difference because we're far worse than Nicodemus and the first century church because we have, well, Ellen White. Yeah, read it. Now remember, we're talking about the character of the people of the church of Philadelphia that came out of this. Okay, you said election worked two ways. God elected us and we chose mm -hmm. to, in patriarchs and prophet I've got the election of God. Every soul is elected who will work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. He is elected who will put on the armor and fight the good fight of faith. He is elected who will watch unto prayer, who will search the scriptures and flee from temptation. He is elected 
who will have the faith continually and who will be obedient to every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The provisions of redemption are free to all. The results of redemption will be enjoyed by those who have complied with its conditions. Kind of a personal responsibility, isn't it? See, this is why Nick, yes, we choose. This is why Nicodemus didn't understand it because according to his form of government, how did it work? Who saved the people? Their election? Or the government of Israel, which he was a high-ranking member of? Who's, that's why he didn't understand it. Yeah. So, Cody. just so I understand, um, this is more of asking than sure. making a statement. Um, my understanding is that the elect of God um, is similar to like an election process where we essentially we're the runners we're, we're, the, we're the front runners and God's the voter and God God is voting for us if we choose to run you so, have that backwards flip it God's already chosen when was the book of life written before the foundation of the so earth. everybody's in it God already chose us. What do we have to then do? You see, you've got it backwards. Gotcha. And whose character do we have to elect to adapt? His character. That's why Nicodemus didn't understand it. Okay, so I got it flipped. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's simple, isn't it? Yes. Predestination becomes, the only thing predestined in the Bible, and I've said this to many, pre, was this right here. That was the only predestination. The only thing predestined about salvation was Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was a done deal. As far as the election that we would make, you see, we don't understand the language anymore. The choice. What is an election? What do you do with an election? You pick a candidate. So who's really, if you will, on trial? The person or the candidate? Jesus, God. Now, I haven't even finished that verse yet because the rest of it's got even more punch than that. God said, because remember, where is John 3.16 located? <laughs> With the conversation of Nicodemus. Yeah, no pun intended. With the conversation of Nicodemus. Isn't it? For God so loved the world, Nicodemus didn't understand God, that he sent his only begotten son this is the predestination, isn't it? And everybody quotes John 3.16, but they don't quote John 3.17, which is quite important to go with it. It's taken out of context. Because what does John 3.17 say? He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to do what? That the world would be saved. John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now let's read the rest of this verse that John... See, so, Cody, God's character is on trial before the universe. He's chosen us to vindicate his character. How? Through a choice we make because of this act, you see. And that act doesn't only show his love, but that act goes way beyond. And Peter says it right here. Peter got it when he wrote this. Peter understood while well, the Holy Spirit was working in him. Because look at what he says the rest of the verse. I'm going to start and read the whole thing. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Okay. You understood. You're doing your homework. The Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience. Ooh, where'd that come from? Obedience to what if the law was done away with? Obedience to what? Now, the next verse tells you exactly what, or the next couple words. And sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So what was Peter referring to when he said obedience and sprinkling of blood? Sprinkling of blood? What? That can only be applied one place. This is the New Testament, folks. In the sanctuary, where was the blood sprinkled? For forgiveness of sin. On the day of atonement, on the mercy seat. To, to atone for what? No law, no sin. No law, no sin. But if there has to be sprinkling and the Spirit's involved and a foreknowledge of God, what knowledge do we have to have of God? That he's some big ogre with a baseball bat? No, that he sent his son, predestination, because he chose everybody that would ever be born 
from Adam on down, no, oh, yes, Adam wasn't born, he was created, that if you want to stay in the book of life, you have to accept the sprinkling of that blood. For what purpose? To be obedient, to have the Holy Spirit so we can keep the law, so we can work. Work, work, work. Does God work or does God sit back and eat grapes? Like some Roman god. Does God work? Today's his busiest day. Today's old is his busiest day. It says, Mrs. White says, and for those who don't want to accept Mrs. White, I have nothing to say to you who are Seventh-day Adventists because you're lost. It's that simple. You show me a people in this Bible from Genesis to Revelation that rejected their prophet that was sent by the Holy Spirit and made it. Show me a single one. One individual. I can even name individuals who were high-ranking officers in Israel who aren't way in heaven. I can show you a man who totally rejected the Holy Spirit in a, in a matter of a few hours and died a crazy man and is going to have a, a, a part in a special resurrection. That would be Pilate and Judas. Although Judas had three and a half years. Pilate had three and a half minutes, basically. But Pilate was more concerned because he got to bring him into this. That whole scene, that whole situation, folks, is a prophecy of what was to come at Christ's crucifixion. What? Do you think that when things start going sideways more than they are now, you're not going to go through the same trial Christ did on our level? Think again. And do you not think that the world's going to want to put the real, truthful Christian to death and choose the the fake? Think again. I said to people this week, where's the Pope and Rome in all this disaster? I haven't heard a peep out of them. I said to some Roman Catholics, what's the richest country in the world? Guess what they said? The Vatican. Well, where are they? Where are they? Why is Rome not flying supplies to these devastated areas? Because they take, they don't give. Destruction and death is their business. Really, according to the Bible, the earthquake, the tornadoes, and the, or, or I mean the uh, 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 hurricanes, will be laid at Rome's feet on Judgment Day. Why did I say that? What does it say in the book of Revelation? Everybody that was killed on the earth from Adam all the way down, who's where will it be laid? at the foot of Rome. Yeah? So, where are they, folks? Where is Barabbas? Because you know what Barabbas meant, right? Son of the Father. You had the real, and you had the apostate, the fake. Which did the Seventh-day Adventist church choose? And who, well, you might say, well, the independents won't do that. Where were the independents when this was going on? <laughs> Where were they? Well, one of them, and I always say this, even ran naked, screaming into the night. So don't tell me that, you know, we're any better off. No, this, the sprinkling of blood, obedience through the Spirit. I will not waste another minute trying to convince a Seventh-day Adventist about the Holy Spirit, because you know what? There's people out there that want to be saved. That I have to explain? How long did Jesus talk to Nicodemus? How long do you think that conversation took, by the way? Two, three hours? I'll bet you it was done in 15 minutes. Because Nicodemus got to the point where he could, his head was... Now, I was telling Cody this morning, I heard a quote from Voltaire, wonderful man. Who was he? The father of what? pretty much the French Revolution. And he made this statement, and I heard it being passed around as uh, pertains to politicians. And he said, Voltaire said, that perfection is the enemy of good. Really. What did we just read about perfection? Voltaire didn't believe in God or the Bible. He wanted that out of his country, out of the world. So yes, who determines good and who determines perfection? Think about that statement. This is my theology, folks. Well, not really, because Nicodemus thought he was good. 
Paul thought when he was Saul. What did he say about his Phariseeism? Same thing that uh, Martin Luther said about his monkery. If anybody could get to heaven by these means, that's what Martin Luther would have, he said. I'm good. But I'm not perfect, you see, because he won't continue doing those things, beating himself, climbing stairs, mar stone stairs on his knees. And so if you were perfect, why would you do that? But he was good. So you see, in that theology, perfection becomes what? The enemy of good. I can deem myself good. What is the basic thought going through the United States now about our uh, state of mind? We're basically good people, right? Have you heard that? What does the Bible say? We're rotten people. We're sent, we're murderers, we're liars, we're rapists, we're adulterers, we're, that's what we are at when we're born. We've broken every one of the commandments what, from as soon as we come out, we're guilty. Correct? So why then would, from that point forward, the Holy Spirit seeks to make us perfect so that we can go to heaven, so that we are the elect and we realize that. But if we say we're good, what do we do with perfect? You see where Voltaire was coming from? And this is a man of wisdom? I suppose he believed in evolution too. See, because evolution was nothing new to Darwin. You know that, right? The ancient Egyptians believed in evolution. There are other civilizations that believed in evolution. It's been through theology. The Greeks basically had an evolution deal going on. I mean, let's face it, anything short of creation by God is what? What does it become? It's evolution. We're getting better. We're good. No, we're not good. We're quite the contrary. And even though you claim to be the goodest amongst us, I know that's not a word, are the worst. That's where Laodicea comes in. We're going to look at that next. So, I mean, in verse 2 of 1 Peter Two, I think, lays out the whole scenario. You want to say the law is done away with? Why did Peter put that in the Bible? What obedience? To what? What sprinkling of what? For what purpose? Now, even, you see, this is the problem, folks, with people that don't understand the Old Testament. How hard is it to understand that verse? How hard is it? Everybody knows that the Jews did, any Christian knows the Day of Atonement in Judaism. They know about that. They know that there was blood sprinkled. Honey, I got to tell you, Rita, I, I, I'd find it hard-pressed to go into a church and them not know about the Day of Atonement because they teach that. Because Jewish nation, the, the, the evangelicals want to see it brought back. They know about that. Maybe not every individual, but they know about the Jewish Day of Atonement. Oh, they know about that. And even if you didn't, you've got to ask the question, what's he talking about, sprinkling of blood? What blood? Because it doesn't say the shedding of blood, right? What does it say? What does Peter say? Sprinkling, that's specific. Now, you could say the shedding of blood, right? Because his blood was shed. No, his blood was sprinkled. And then it comes into the Ron Wyatt stuff, doesn't it? That Peter says this. Well, what do you mean the sprinkling of Christ's blood? How did it get on the mercy seat? Because that's exactly what he's referring to. Well, we know where the mercy seat was when Jesus died, do we not? Under the cross. We know about the crack that went down. We know about the blood that dripped. It was a sprinkling too, by the way. So Peter's assessment of this situation is 100% accurate because Peter's smart or because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Peter made, well, never mind. But he knew the Jewish system. He knew what this meant. Now, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, again, folks, this puts another twist on things. Who is Peter saying is responsible for, for our salvation in that verse. Jesus or God? Make no doubt about it. Read what it says. 
How did Jesus come here? By whose permission? How was Jesus resurrected? By whose power? How did Jesus perform his miracles? By whose power? He himself said, I do nothing of myself. When he resurrected uh, um, Lazarus, what did he do? Who did he ask? Did he just run up there and say, all right, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he do that? He could have. Could he not have? He was still God. But you see, he was in human form. If Jesus had done it any other way, what would men say? What would they say? Oh, Rome already says it. Oh, he wasn't human. He was God, and that proves it. Why do you think Jesus went so far out of his way to explain that everything I have done is not of me, but it's of the Father which is in heaven? You know, uh, Bill uh, was talking about the Godhead, and this is a big issue, of course. We're, we're not even supposed to use that word. The Trinity, we're not even supposed to use that word in, in Adventism, which is another veil of the devil, because the Father, the Son, the Holy, they are all equal, but they all have separate jobs, separate roles, and they work within their role. Because I could, I'm here to tell you, God could have said before he gave his Son, you know what? I've written the book of life, and you know, I'm going to make every one of them perfect. Instead, the theology is, enemy of good is perfect. The enemy is, no, I'm going to make every one of them a sinner and then save them. Think about those two thoughts. Because if you say that because of what Jesus did, the law was done away with, then God did away with his own law. Because according to what I just read, and Paul says it in other places in the Bible, that God raised him from the dead. He was God's Christ. Here, Peter is giving, verse 3, Blessed be the God of, and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy, whose mercy out here? Jesus or the Father? He's talking about God's mercy. Hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. He's claimed us back again. What, what point is Peter talking about? When were we fully gods? Only one point. Who, was the, who were born in perfection? Or, or created in perfection. Who lived in perfection? Only Adam and Eve. After the fall, he claimed us back again through his gift of grace, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Rodney? I just had a thought. I don't know what you would do with it. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, if God did away with his law, he would have to do away with his character. Exactly. Now, what character would he have if he did away with his character? Exactly. So there's Satan's... That's th the whole point, Rodney. That's the whole point. Because what did Lucifer say? He wanted to do what? Ascend the throne of the Most High? In other words, my character. You see? But you see, Peter takes this thing to a very incontroversible level when he makes these simple statements. God sent his son. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? In John 3.16. What did he say? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Do you see how that fits? Not to condemn the world if we move on, but through him, what? He may save the world. So you have to accept Jesus Christ and him crucified. It took Paul a little while to get that, didn't it? After Mars Hill, he understood that. When Peter wrote this, he understood that. But this is what we lose sight of. And I have said before, that the theological world and the Christian world takes Jesus and makes him an idol above God. You see, because if you believe that Jesus did away with the law, you've just put God and Jesus where? 
at odds. How intelligent is the devil? But then you go ahead and teach that the Holy Spirit is whatever. A bowl of jello, a bubble, I don't know. Because I don't think they know what they believe. Because they're speaking Babylonian. Or Babel, rather, not Babylonian. They're at the Tower of Babel and they're confused. Because you see how that devil has just destroyed our belief and what we need to know about Christ and Him crucified. See, Philadelphia, this group of people had to be brought back to that. Because of hundreds of years. Yeah, Cody, go ahead. Because of hundreds of years of this garbage. The law has been done away with. The law has been done away with. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. The law has been done away with. So Peter here makes it pretty plain, I think. And let's go uh, now to Romans 11. Romans 11, and I want to look at... Um, Verses uh, 4 through 6. Paul says here, you got to get him involved in this discussion. <laughs> well, this is, well, anyhow, I'll just read it. It says, but what says the answer of God unto him? He's talking, well, let's read verse 3. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Who's this about? Elisha. At what particular instance, situation? This is after Mount Carmel, is it not? And it's interesting because there's, Israel was given a choice, weren't they? How long will you halt between two opinions? If Baal is God, then follow him. But if God is God, then follow him. Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. Hmm. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the, what, of grace? Election. The choice of grace. Even at this time, there are thousands and thousands of faithful Seventh-day Adventists. Isn't that wonderful? They get what Peter was saying. They get what Jesus said to Nicodemus. So, what are they doing about it? It's not just us that is spreading the three angels' messages, folks. What was Elijah told? Now, remind you, Keep in mind, 7,000 men does not mean just 7,000 people. I don't know how big those families were back then. That's 20, 30,000. And you know what? Elijah thought that was amazing. Where, where, where are they? Well, I've got them. They're working. Just like the 144,000 folks, that's an incredibly large number. How many Jesuses do you know in our societies? What I mean by that is living exactly like Christ lived. Do you know anybody? I don't. Myself included. But these people were exactly as Jesus Christ was when he walked the earth. That is an amazing amount. One would turn the world upside down. Because How do I know that? Why did I make that statement? Because the one that was here 2,000 years ago, what did they do to him? The most powerful government in the world couldn't have them. Why? Who was in charge of that government? If God was leading that government, Jesus never would have died that way. So who was leading that government? Isn't that interesting? And what's worse is, who was leading his church at that time? That they chose Barabbas, the devil, don't find this hard to believe. However, there's always, you see, folks, these people, these remnant people, well, they're, they have the character of the Church of Philadelphia. Do you see that? 
I suppose in that time of what they call the great disappointment, they looked around. And what do you think they said to each other? <laughs> There's none of us left. But what do you think God said to them? Right there. What do you, what, 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 right there. Paul says it right there. What he said to Elijah. Oh, don't worry. I have my people. Yeah, there were 50 left. After Ascension Rock. These people had the character that is mentioned in Revelation of the Church of Philadelphia. Do you think they felt even more isolated than Elijah did? You better believe it. Why did I say that? Well, the world was a much bigger place then. And as I said, the conference has gone out of their way to keep quiet how big the Millerite movement really was. I strongly recommend you get that video that Cliff Robertson narrates about that time and watch it. Because they show you the newspaper headlines in France, in Germany, in England, all around the world that were discussing what the Millerite movement was doing. And there were uh, riots and churches and everything over this. Have you ever heard that before? It's a fact. I don't, what was the name of that video, Rita? Was it the shot heard around the world? Yeah, R watch it. You are going to be, uh, they show you the headlines. All the major cities in the world were discussing what William Miller was preaching. Yeah, I'm sure you can get it on YouTube. And it's, it's done, uh, Cliff Robertson is a narrator. I used to have it on VHS, but I don't know. I got rid of it when I got rid of it. I gave it to somebody. I don't have VHS anymore. But you can get it. I'm sure Amazon's got it. Uh, anyhow, they've done a good job of keeping it quiet. So what kind of a disappointment would that have been, I wonder? That movement changed the world. That movement ushered in full path for giving the three angels' messages. That movement brought these people forward that Paul was talking about here in Romans. You see? This remnant movement. Even today, as we look around in this church, we say, oh, it should be full. Well, it is today. <laughs> There's how many here? Ten? But anyhow... No, he has his people. But you see, we've got to think of Gideon, don't we? We've got to think of Gideon. And Gideon was faithful to go into battle with 300 guys. A torch and a pot. Did it for him. Did it not? He doesn't, he's not going to have mega churches. No pun intended there either. Oh no, those days are long, 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 long gone. When did Jesus let his people know? When did the Holy Spirit let his people know that was done? Well, there were some fires that took place in Battle Creek, weren't there? Hmm. What were they about? The publishing work? Got burnt to the ground, did it? Why? Because they weren't doing the three angels' messages anymore. Then what burnt to the ground? The hospital, the sanitarium. Why? They were no longer doing the health message in relationship to the three angels' messages. And what did God say? This is a mega deal. We're not having it. The education system started getting polluted. You see? So that had to disperse. Yeah, read it. I want to get into Mrs. Wright's commentary because, of course, as usual, I can't say it the way she does. But you see, in all those instances of the fires, what were they doing? They rejected Mrs. Wright's warnings. And what they did, they did not then at that point have the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of prophecy's testimony of Jesus. That's what they were missing. And they rejected it and they died. Because Very good point. So what really did they reject? Ellen White? Or did they reject the Holy Spirit? Is this a new thing? It's just rewrapped and reserved in a night. No, uh, Rodney. I don't know. Cody might have some. He says, if you reject me, I'll reject you and your children. Yep. Yep. So... We see these warnings given by the apostles. Folks, why do they know so much about it, the apostles? Why?
They lived this stuff. They had to make choices that we do not have to make. Especially Paul. He was going to be the high priest at one day. When he decided to become a Christian, which was actually an insult, remember? What did he give up? Everything. Rita? So he understood this situation. Peter, he left his business, his home. Interesting. But Paul wasn't giving anything up because even the priesthood was done when Christ died. Yep. That was the end of it. There was no priesthood for him to, yep. to come into anymore. Exactly. But he realized that. And all due res you know, given all due respect to the first priest, Mrs. White says clearly that after Stephen Stoning, after Christ crucified, many of the honest, faithful priests did what? They came out and became Christians. They started preaching the gospel. So there were sincere men, just like Joseph and Nicodemus. Nicodemus. So this Philadelphian character, can we see it back then? Did they leave their crops standing in the field? Did they leave their important positions to preach the gospel, to live a life for Christ? So we see again the Philadelphian character there. You could say the Philadelphian character is the character the 144,000 will have. <laughs> but that's where it started in 1844. Exactly, Rita. That, I don't call that a disappointment, folks. I don't. Do you? It's a reappointment. Re Thank you. It's a re-election, isn't it? Well, then you may as well call that a disappointment, too if you're going to call that. Because what happened to the faithful people when Christ was crucified? They were crushed. They had to go back and look at the scriptures again, didn't they? And we know that out of Jesus' own mouth. Because when he was resurrected and on the way to Emmaus, what did he tell those faithful men? He had to go back and tell them all the prophecies about himself. And by the way, he was preaching out of the Old Testament. You New Testament Christians. It was the same. It was the same thing that happened in 1844. It happened back then. They had to go back to the prophecies, and understand what they were missing. And it was all. Everything was surrounded with the the, in um, as the apostle Paul points out that he, they taught people out of the law of Moses, and the prophets. So there was prophecy and the sanctuary there. And it was the same exact thing that happened in 1844 yeah. when they didn't understand. They had to go back to the prophecies and back, once they learned the sanctuary, they understood what was really going on. They had to reelect again. They had to make a choice. So it was rough going. I don't think yet anybody sitting in here understands what these people went through. Guarantee you that. But then those people don't understand what the disciples went through at Christ's crucifixion either. They couldn't. All, all our experiences are relative, you see. Because, you see, if you believe that perfection is the enemy of good, then you're not going to accept this. Then you're going to want to get rid of the Holy Spirit. I don't want a good church. I want a perfect church. Because that's the only way I can see my flaws. And to have a perfect church, can any man be in charge of it? Who has to be in charge of it? God, through his Son and his Spirit, through their individual jobs, not mixed, matched together and, and, and throw this one away and accept this one. No, they each have distinct, even God. That's how regimented God is. He could overthrow this whole thing and start over again. He doesn't even have to give a reason. But he's not. He put himself on trial before the test my law and see. The whole universe, folks, we lose tra sight of that. Uh, yeah, Rodney. Good and perfect. The difference is uh, between the churches of Babylon and the 144,000. You got that right. That's exactly correct. And as Cody pointed out this morning, you can determine what good is. Because even Paul says that. What did Paul say about when he was a Pharisee. Before the law, what law was he talking about? 
just serving God between him and him, meaning God and Paul. You see, that's the law he was talking about. And the uh, agencies which God used to spread his law. Remember, maybe this makes a little more sense. In the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. For what reason? To see God's character. What we have to come up to, perfection. And we can live that way. But it's going to cost us our life because that proves it. <laughs> Whether it's, it's, it's physically or just the mind's got to be cleaned out and rebuilt. Let us make man in our own image. Yeah, Rodney. It would rephrase what I just said or add to it. The difference between the two is sanctification. There you go. Thank you. That's perfect. And how do we become sanctified? What did, what did Peter say? To the Spirit. And the sprinkling of the blood. And we, is that simple? How much simpler do you want it? And for me to become sanctified through the Spirit tells me it has to be something that has a mind, a will, and knows me, and creates, makes a custom fit path to obedience. So you want to say that the Holy Spirit isn't that? Then you can't be sanctified. You understand that? Because Peter says clearly, well, we'll just get rid of Peter too then, okay? Peter didn't go to college. Peter was no theologian. Let's get, oh, yes, he was a theologian. Yes, he, how long was Peter in college? Mm, three and a half years. He was in accelerated. He was in the college of heaven, which is probably uni equivalent to a life down here, and you still wouldn't have it. You see? And he was a theologian when he came out. That was led by the Holy Spirit. He had the mind that is in Christ was in him. You see? That's what Paul says, but that was only for Paul. But Paul said that before the law, I was alive, but then the law came and I died. But I thought Paul was a good guy. Why would God kill good people? Because he was an imperfection. You see the problem? And it was only one way to get there. Not through rules and laws and religion, through the indwelling of the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit. Yes, Cody. That statement by Voltaire, something tells me that he didn't come up with it. It's some, yeah, something. probably stole it. Well, I don't know. It, it, it sounds so devilish. It's an inversion. It's a complete inversion of what the truth is. Because perfection is only the enemy of good if your version of good is different than what the law states. Exactly. So what is good then? What, what you say, what, what Voltaire says is good, is good? Versus what the Bible says? Because what the Bible says is good is perfection. And they're not at odds with each other. But Voltaire's statement, he's saying they're at odds. Yep. Yes. It's all relative. It's right? relative. But if you go to the Satanic Bible, Voltaire, when, when Anton LaVey talks about the law, Voltaire's statement fits perfectly in there. And then when Rodney's done, I'll quote to you why. Go ahead, Rodney. Uh, good is the norm. Today, the yeah. norm is homosexuality. That's good. Uh, 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 living, out in, living together out of wedlock. That's the good today. Yep. And, and to say to, and Anton LaVey's Bible, it says, the, uh, the, the satanic scriptures, he that says unto me, thou shalt not, is my moral enemy. Do what thy wilt is the whole of the law. Well, that, you could say, is the same statement as perfection is the enemy of good. You determine what's good, not the law of God, which is perfection. So Voltaire's statement came right out of Anton LaVey's Bible, which wasn't even written yet. His, uh, Crawley wasn't even around then. So whose mind is being worked here? So under that understanding of good and evil, then you have to get rid of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because that points to perfection. I want to read these statements from Mrs. White here. Uh, she says, 
if we comply with the conditions that the Lord has made, we shall secure our election to salvation. We'll secure our choice. And also, God's choice. You see, it works both sides. Perfect obedience to his commandment is the evidence that we love God and are not hardened in sin. So that's perfection. That's not good. I can go out and feed a hungry person. Oh, you're good. I can go and, and give, Rita and I can give everything we own to people in Houston or Puerto Rico. We're good, are we? Is that what God wants? Mm. See, David understood born again because he explains it in Psalms 51. So why didn't Nicodemus understand it? David marched to the beat of a different drummer. That's why, if you will. Christ has a church in every age. They are the, uh, there are in the church those who are not made any better by their connection with it. They themselves break the terms of their election. Obedience to the commandments of God gives us a right to the privilege of his church. Isn't that interesting? So what makes a church? The charter of the church? No, obedient patrons to the commandments of God make a church that the Holy Spirit resides in, that the Shekinah resides in. Oh, we can't use those terms, though. The Holy Spirit can't be here. That was in the Jewish temple. Oh, really? Every one of us is to bring the Holy Spirit in with us when we come in that door. If he doesn't, then it's not God's church, not God's people. Wow. Wow. She says, now here are the most precious jewels of truth for every individual soul of us. Here is the only election in the Bible that you can prove yourself elected of Christ by being faithful. You can prove yourself the chosen of Christ by abiding in the vine. By cutting the roots out of the vine? Because if you say the law was done away with, what do you do to the vine? What's anchoring the vine? Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. He that says to me, thou shalt not, is my mortal enemy. That's Lucifer's theology. So what, what is the vine if there's nothing to anchor it? Dead. You want to graft yourself into a dead vine? So what do we do? We go get fake plants. Hmm. Do we have fake characters? We're going to stop there. I wanted to go into Ezekiel 9, talking about uh, the ceiling. Well, you all know what that is. But folks, clearly, the statement that Jesus made to Nicodemus rocked him to the foundations of his soul. How is it you are a master of Israel and you don't know the simplicity of the gospel message? How is that? David knew it. Adam knew it. Noah knew it. Abraham knew it because who was the promise given to? Abraham. So how is it? As we move forward, you want to talk about evolution. How about devolving? How can we be dumber than monkeys that lived thousands of years before us? If evolution is true. Because they understood it. These guys and their families, for the most part, will be in heaven. What did Joshua say at the end of his term? As for me and my house, we will do what? We will worship God. We will keep his commandments. That's what that means. You know, it's interesting, and I'm going to close with this. In the Garden of Eden, there was only one commandment mentioned. Only one, given to Adam and Eve. What was it? The fourth, why? Simple. They had to understand God in his true nature. That's what the fourth commandment does. The lawgiver, the life giver, the judge, the reason for our existence, he gave them that. He didn't quote the other nine, just the fourth commandment. So what did the devil go after? Did God really mean what he said? Think about that. 
What was he attacking when he said that? The only thing that Eve knew at that point, of course, they were studying along, was the fourth commandment. That was the one that was mentioned. Interesting. Because that is the heart of God's character and all that it pertains to, you see. That's the only one that was mentioned in the Garden of Eden. It's interesting because up until the fall, the angels didn't even know there was a law. They just lived that way because it was right. They elected to do that, you see. It was written in their minds and hearts. That's absolutely correct. Their emotions were controlled by God's law. Exactly. Everything, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you again for the simplicity of your gospel message. And we are responsible to know all the aspects that have been revealed through your scripture, through your prophets, especially through Mrs. White. We ask, Father, for wisdom. But first, Lord, we must die to self. We must give up this earth and all that is in it and in us. We must be able to say, as Jesus did, the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. That's the only way we will survive. Please be with us and help us to do a better work for you, Father, here and at home and everywhere. Please help us to have your spirit fully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.